phone to say get on up here. I'm sure he intended on coming. But he's probably talking. He's captivated by the presentation. Now. Actually, I wanted to go to that. I spaced it up. What's the presentation going downstairs? I feel like I should know. Is it the? It's the uh, open house. Littleton planning kickoff meeting where they're looking at the Broadway corridor. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it's good stuff. They have one on Thursday. I think I might go down to Littleton. I don't know if I have. I can run down. You want me to just run down and get them? Uh, sure. We do need them to make quorum, so I guess. Oh, I'll rope them in. They're like, hey, we need you. Yeah. <laughs> Be right back. Yeah, we have one of our sustainability commission members, Evan, took a three month sabbatical to go like biking across um, like Peru, I think. Awesome. That's like, we need you for Quora, but I'm happy for you. We're uh, roping in our final straggler of Rick so we can make Quora. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was like, we have the people, they're just not in the room. <laughs> Didn't you just take a big trip somewhere? Yeah, I went to Greece. Oh, how was that? Uh, it was beautiful. Yeah. The food was so amazing. I always, I really haven't traveled outside of the country that much besides Mexico and um, a vacation, well, a choir trip in high school to Prague. But I have the memory of my mother, so I really don't remember much of it. It's okay. <laughs> but... Whenever anyone travels abroad and they're like, the food is just so good. I'm like, oh, I feel like they're like gassing it up. Like maybe it's not. And I went to Greece. So I was like, this is some of the best. <laughs> <laughs> like the bread was so good. I think I ate like my body worth and a half in bread. But yeah, it was awesome. We did get hit with really bad weather though. Really? Like, you know how Denver has just been like very gloomy and rainy? That was kind of Greece for a majority of the time really? that we were there. Uh, <laughs> But it was still great. Yeah. You can never complain about vacation. Yeah, seriously. Evan, this presentation looks beautiful. Lots of pictures. <laughs> Lots of pictures. Do you all have any fun summer plans? Summer vacation plans. Joe, you with the kiddos, we think in Disney World. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, no, we're going. I'm taking my three oldest backpacking here in a couple weeks. This is awesome. Okay. Yeah, for the last three, I've taken one, one each one of the oldest three for okay. a one night backpacking trip. Each of the last three years, just me and one on one. That's awesome. I just loved it. Oh, they so must love I've it. tricked them into thinking backpacking is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so we just went like a mile, a set up a tent. No, so they, they think it's the best thing in the world. So now I'm gonna go make them hike like five. And Dad minutes. carries all the uh, all yeah, the gear and equipment. Gear, yeah. <laughs> so now it's gonna it's gonna be a little more hardcore. That's so funny. How old are they? Uh, twelve, ten. Five girls. That is gonna be so awesome. We have to show us pictures next time. We're doing great. Oh. I'm look over your shoulder okay. here. Okay. Perfect. So you're gonna water bottle and all. <laughs> so here's what we got. Okay. So calling to order. You do a Thank you everybody for showing up. We have a quorum here. We did a minute ago. <laughs> so we'll get right to it. Yeah. Hey Steve. Hello. <laughs> we are ready. All right. Call to order. Um, welcome, guests, Evan. And want to go around the table and introduce ourselves? <laughs> so, Kara, would you start round robin? Uh, I'm Kara from Japani. I've lived in Inglewood since 2018 and I've been on this committee uh, since it was keeping Englewood kind of beautiful. I think I'm on my last year. I don't know, I don't know how it works, but yeah. That's what everyone thinks and they usually right, Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, happy to be here. Great, thanks, Karen. Uh, Evan Anderson Forrester with the city of Englewood. 
uh, Michael Chisholm, uh, chairperson, been in Englewood for eight years. Michael Eaglin, <coughs> sustainability coordinator. Joe Anderson, council liaison. Yelta Duncan, lived in Englewood for one year now. Rick Emil Hines, lived in Englewood for almost nine years now. Stephen Strawbridge member, been in Englewood too. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Matthew Schultz, I've lived in Inglewood for 10 years and a uh, member on the Sustainability Commission for almost a year. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. Uh, hopefully we've had a chance to look at the minutes. Uh, any questions, corrections, modifications to the minutes? Last meeting? There are no changes. Do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Thank you, Rick. Second. Second. Thank you, Cara. Okay. So moved. All right. Then we're just going to go right the list. into so the next go ahead. tree ordinance. All right. So hold on. Let me share my screen really yeah. quick. Find the right one. Um, all right, so we're going to kick things off today with a tree ordinance, uh, tree protection ordinance. So a little bit of background. On May 8th, City Council had a meeting and they requested that the Sustainability Commission kind of look at some maybe potential tree protection ordinances for the city. Uh, from what I understand, there's really no deadline, no timeline on this. So we wanted to start the discussion today with our definite expert on this, our sister Urban Forester. Evan Anderson. So today we're going to hear from him about, you know, what an ordinance is, learn more about it. We can all mull over it and then probably next meeting when everyone can simmer on it, create a memo or if you guys want two meetings, really whatever you all want to do. Uh, but today is just to kind of start that discussion. So Evan has a presentation that I'll go ahead and share. <coughs> Oh, there we go. Take it away. Take it away. Thank you, though. I'm going to try to be short and sweet, but if anybody has a question, go ahead and ask it whenever it comes to your mind. And we either talk about it right then or maybe save it for the very end of the presentation if it's something I am going to talk about in the future. And as we go through this, I'll start off by saying that I'm an expert in tree care and forestry, not an expert in city code. <laughs> so when I start talking about other cities and their codes and their policies, uh, take that with a grain of salt. You know, I've read through them, I've looked through it, um, but just know that it might not be 100% accurate. I even found trouble deciphering our own city's code it's in a few different places here and there. Um, so feel free to look through Inglewoods, you know, form your own opinions about how it's interpreted and how it, how you see it. Um, Cause there's always something that I probably missed in there. Um, so go to the next slide though. Sorry, it just takes a while on yep. my computer side. So first thing to say about what, what is the point in having a tree ordinance like what is it trying to do and you can see right there it's establishing how a community maintains and protects its urban forest so in a lot of urban areas without influence usually from local or state government people will ignore trees they'll see them as an obstacle or they'll say well, i'm going to build this house i'm going to do this i'm going to remove my trees look at all these other ones it's not going to make a big difference but when you start looking at the forest as a whole, as an urban forest, not as individual trees, if everybody starts doing that, then you suddenly start seeing a huge loss in your urban forest canopy. So something like a tree ordinance can protect street trees, public trees, private trees, provide guidelines for tree protection, and really needs to be flexible and needs to be created in a way that balances all the different interests in the city or the community 
the different values you have around trees and different sort of ethics you have, whether that's environmental ethics or economic ethics, whatever it is, it's sort of you have to have a sort of a balance between this. And this is why you'll see in Colorado, a lot of tree ordinance is very similar, far in a few places like Boulder that have very different tree ordinances. Um, but across the country, uh, you'll see very different ways tree ordinances are built. And that's because of this balance of values and interests and things like that. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, um, And this is the basic thing about how a tree ordinance is built. You have a goal, you have a scope, you have your strategies, your standards, who's responsible for it? How are you going to enforce these things? That's the basic idea of how a tree ordinance is built. Um, and they all of them have these things. Now, underneath one of these categories, you can have very different strategies, very different standards, um, but every tree ordinance needs these six basic things. Go to the next one, Mel. And so let's talk about what we have in Inglewood now. And if anybody noticed something that I'm missing, go ahead and blurt it out. So we have our, in our city code, we have something called trees and shrubs, and that outlines like the tree advisory board, um, who is responsible for right of way trees in the city, which is the property owners. Here in Inglewood, uh, planting standards, tree care standards, um, removal of street trees, uh, prohibited at, uh, prohibited things you can't do to trees, um, things like that. And then we have and more of the building code side of thing, the landscape and screening is what it was called. And this has our code such as size requirements for trees being planted. At, new developments, uh, spacing requirements, distance to structures, distance to sidewalks, um, a credit system uh, for trees being preserved, um, and sort of minimum requirements you have to have in your landscape, number of trees, things like that. Uh, one thing that sort of in the landscape and screening and also in the trees and shrubs is missing is tree protection. So in the city code, as it's written now, you know, it says you need to preserve these trees, but it outlines nothing about how the trees need to be preserved. Um, like what process do you need to use? Who's going to be checking on it? So you can, developers and builders can use that as a way to, yeah, I'm, I'm going to protect this tree, but have no intention of having it survive, which is really common. Why tree ordinances need some teeth? Because in development, it's very easy for developers to, yeah, yeah we're going to protect the tree and actually develop the property knowing that the trees are going to die and they'll be removed. Because construction will kill most trees, no matter what you, if, if you don't protect it properly, construction is going to kill the tree. So a tree ordinance needs a little bit of teeth uh, and needs some guidelines in order to be effective. Um, I haven't lived in Inglewood. I've only worked here for a year and a half, but I don't know if I've ever seen a tree protection fence in Inglewood. I don't know if anybody else has. So, so it's obvious that which a basic thing for tree protection is keeping people away from the tree isn't happening in Inglewood, even though it's part of our city code. Um, and then I wrote a tree protection plan for Inglewood Parks. And Mel, you should be able to click on that little document and open it up. Maybe not. Okay, it's not working. Everyone should just have really good eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> it, should, it should open it up as, as a PDF. So maybe Mel, if you take it out of presentation mode, maybe it'll open. It's just an, an image. Oh, oh, there we go. Here, wait, if I need to stop and then share a different way. So this document will give you an idea of what tree protection looks like for people that aren't 
aware of what you need to do. So now if you'll scroll down. <coughs> um, I can oh, did I send you this? Um, no, I didn't get it. Okay, um, I can send it over to you. So if anybody wants to read it more closely, you can. This is the basic thing, how you protect trees. First, outline the site. Figure out what trees are there. Uh, you figure out which trees you want to protect because you don't normally protect every single tree. Some trees might be half dead, some might be dangerous, some might be cracked, some might be species you don't want, might be invasive species. Um, so you do your tree assessments, you figure out what's there, what you're going to keep. And then would you design something around something called a critical root zone? So when you're looking at the root zone of a tree, a lot of people think that it's a deep root system, and that's not really true. It's more like a plate. So the tree, if this iPad is a root zone and this is the tree, this is what it looks like. So it's 90% of your roots are in the top 18 inches, and it goes very wide, sometimes twice the width of the tree, depending on how much soil you have around it. So you got to think, imagine we're trenching. We trench right there. All right, we just lost 40% of our roots. How can we sustain this canopy with, with only 60% of our root system? And that's why tree uh, protection is so important. So first we, de we define our critical root zone. In general, you do one foot for every inch of PBH, which is diameter of breast height, four and a half feet. So well, if you scroll down, there should be a little graphic of what a critical root zone looks like. And you can divide that into half a critical root zone, quarter critical root zone. And the idea in a tree protection zone is what you build after a critical root zone is you're trying to save 50% of that critical root zone. And that would be called your tree protection zone. You can save 100%, you can do 150%, but minimum is 50%. And you don't want to ever go more than a quarter of critical root zone so see that 20 inch tree, you never want to do anything within five feet of the tree. No adding soil, no digging, no cutting, nothing. You get closer than that, you're going to start killing the tree. And you also make the tree unstable. In a windstorm, it can blow out of the ground on that side because it's lost all its anchorage on one side of the tree. So does this does this have to do with anything to do with the soil itself and what how it anchors to the soil? I used to be in a Highlands Ranch. We were all in sand. Yeah. Um, and, and that whole that doesn't work because everything was six inches deep because that's what everybody had as far as soil. But is it very depending on the soil itself? It will. Your root zone won't vary normally. And if you have sandy soil, it might vary in depth a little bit because the roots can grow deeper since there's oxygen deeper in the soil. But in general, how the root system works is it goes out and sends anchoring roots down like little little tent pegs down. So that's going to happen in whatever soil you have. You'll have your shallowest root zone in clay soil because the roots can't grow deep because there's no oxygen. So usually in sandier soil, um, you actually have a denser root zone. Sand. And I'm not saying that that's something we have to, sand isn't an issue, but yeah. clay is, yeah. you know, we have quite a bit of clay. Yeah, so definitely, you know, when we have clay, our roots are even higher up. In, in the soil profile. So um, it does make a difference, but not enough of a difference where it needs to change how we protect trees. So now scroll down quick. And there's some sort of guidelines about, you know, little things that we do. Scroll down again, though. And this is what like tree protection zones look like. So you scroll down to the next picture. You'll see what examples of what half of a critical root zone is different shapes, different sizes, but none of them get within that quarter distance and they're all protecting 50% of the root zone. These are all minimum sort of things. So this is something that I wrote for parks where we need to protect trees and there's irrigation projects, construction, you know, things like that. This is how we're going to go about doing it. Um, so now we'll go back to the presentation. So that's a real quick overview of how tree protection works. And that is something that the city is missing in, in the code right now, outlining something like that. Go to the next slide. And let's look real quick at what some other communities are doing. 
we're going to go real quick. So we'll start with Denver. Denver protects their public and right away trees. In Denver, they have a lot of trees in the grass strip between the sidewalk, sidewalk and the curb. All those trees are protected by the city of Denver. You're not allowed to remove one. You're not allowed to inject one without a permit. Um, in Inglewood, we don't really have a lot of those trees. It's mostly our sidewalk goes right to the curb. There are a few blocks in sort of northern Inglewood that do. Um, but we don't have that many like Denver does. Uh, so you need a permit to do anything in Denver for those trees. Um, you get that through the forestry office, and those are the trees that are protected in Denver. You'll see construction in Denver. You'll see the chain link fence around the trees. You'll notice that it's normally only around the tree in the grass strip because those are the only ones that are protected. In the yard, you rarely see a fence because they don't have to protect those in the same way. Um, in Littleton, Oh, so also in Denver, they don't protect trees on private property. That's pretty common throughout Colorado. Um, in in Lakewood, uh, it's a little bit similar to to Denver. Um, they protect trees uh, over eight inches. They go out and actually inspect the trees on new developments, apartment buildings, commercial properties, things like that. I don't believe they do it for single family homes like renovations, but they do it on larger developments and they have a system where um, you can either mitigate if you're removing a tree, you have to get a permit first and that's inspected by their city forester. You either have to plant new trees that match that diameter or pay $1,200 per tree that you're removing over eight inches and that money goes back into a fund that the Lakewood City uses to plant trees back into that district where the development is. Um, Littleton uses a very similar process. You need a permit to remove trees over four inches in Littleton. Um, or you, and something that they're doing is coming out next year, I was told for Littleton, is a fee based program to remove trees on new developments. But single family homes will be exempt from uh, the fee for removing trees. So only for commercial and uh, high density residential. Is that fee based the same as Lakewood where it would go into a fund to read? They have it passed through council. Got yeah. it. So, Got it. but that's that's the plan. And that's usually how this is done. The money gets funneled somewhere into account that those trees are planted back into that district or area or neighborhood. Um, and then we start looking at other places. Uh, Austin, Texas has a very strong uh, tree protection program so strong that the governor is trying to outlaw all tree protection ordinance in the entire state. Um, it, but it's it's very complicated and it really inhibits development in the city, which is why developers hate it. Uh, tree lovers love it. So trees start being protected at eight inches. Once they get 24 inches in diameter, depending on what species they are, they're 100% protected. Once they're 30 inches in diameter, they're 100% protected. You cannot dig around them. You cannot get inside the critical root zone or you'll be fined by the city. And they fine you by inch. And um, it's it doesn't hit, you have a big, huge oak in your backyard, yeah, you can't build a garage. So I'm from Austin. My parents built a garage in their backyard. They had to spend a lot of money. Their, their garage is actually elevated off the ground. It looks like a slab, but it's a floating slab because they're not allowed to disrupt the huge 40 inch pecan trees that are on all three sides of it. So their garage actually doesn't, it has little piers that hold it up, even though it's a two story building. Um, so, you know, th that's an example of how you can take it a little bit farther. Boulder is more like that as well. They have different values around trees, how they want to protect them. So if you've ever been to Austin, it has a very dense, very strong tree canopy throughout the entire city. This is why because you're not allowed to remove the trees. Um, permits are required for everything. Uh, it's really intense. Um, Salt Lake City has something a little bit similar. Uh, their code mandates tree protection for all trees during construction. You have to have permits to remove anything. They have specimen trees based on species, based on what their city forester says is specimen tree, and those have to be protected. You have to replant two inches of diameter for every one inch you remove on your property. And if you don't have the spacing, then they they charge you. So you have to pay back 
not really sure where that money goes, but um, you can see a theme here. Basically, some people say can't remove any tree. So we say, oh, you can remove, but you have to pay us. And those are like, or you, or you do nothing. And those are the kind of ways that a lot of cities go through um, their tree ordinance to protect the urban forest. Go to that next one, though. Are there any variants there if you have a diseased tree? Oh, yeah, there's tons of exemptions. So in any of these, anytime there's a permit, it's going to be inspected by a forester. So they'll say, OK, that's a tree of heaven. We want that out of here. It's invasive. This one's rotten. This one has pine beetles. So there is an inspection process and exemptions for certain species that we don't want around. And then it might be you might see this little two inch tree, but wait a minute, that is a very important species. So it goes both ways. There's exceptions on both sides. When you were talking about Aaron's garage, does, does a slab like that, does that solution solve or is it a nutrient underneath a cement slab so useless that the roots are going to die anyway? So there's actually an air gap between the soil and the slab and there's piers holding the slab up. So the soil is actually not impacted at all. So there's nothing step, there's nothing on it. There's still air circulation. The worms can still go around. So it's floating. It looks like a slab because that side's on, but it's actually floating. So you're out, like we're talking about the, the root zone. So instead of putting the slab and removing a large part of the root zone, they're only doing a tiny percentage of it with little piers that are drilled down. They have to be air spaded by an arborist make sure they're not hitting roots over two inches of diameter. It's, it's, a, it's a process. <laughs> and so it, in, it is heavy development, but they're doing it on purpose, right? So otherwise, my parents would have removed three 80 foot tall, 120 year old pecan trees. So there's, there's, my mom loves the tree awareness, but hates it when it affects her. Yeah, sure. And that's how most people are. They, yeah, my neighbor keep their tree, shades my backyard. Oh, I can't build my patio. I hate it now, and it's it's really common. So that's that's the balancing act that you have to have with an ordinance. Um, so things that that we can do, things we can talk about doing, we can determine what what goal we have. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to inhibit removal of any tree in the city? Um, which isn't very pragmatic. It's not very practical. It's never going to happen. Um, are we just trying to do it for huge scrapes? Are we, what kind of exemptions are we going to have? Single family homes? Are we only going to target commercial uh, high density developments? Are we going to target everything? Um, do we have support to do something like this? Without community support, without council support, it's going to go nowhere. Um, and then, you know, we can make recommendations. Um, you know, this group doesn't, and myself, we don't make policy. We can only make recommendations to those that do make policy decisions. So we have to make sure that whatever we choose, whether it's fees or best management practices, mitigation, preservation strategies we have, it's something that will work for Inglewood. It will accomplish the goal we have, but not take away all our other options. It needs to be flexible for the next one. And so I'm talking about roadblocks, like do we have, is there support for something like this? Does the city even have the infrastructure to do something like this? Can you say, okay, we're going to protect every tree of these species over 10 inches in diameter? Who's going to check it? Is it going to go to me? Like, how, is, how does that work? Um, and then the bureaucracy of government, like, how do we create this policy? How do we push it through? How do we... Uh, make something that doesn't just add more red tape for, for building new homes and the people developing their properties. And then the last one, Bill. And so this is kind of where, as a group, you know, discussing these ideas, this is some ways forward that I see um, publishing tree protection guidelines. It's a guideline, it's not a policy not an ordinance, but like, let's say you do want to protect this tree in your front yard. This is the process how you do it. Because one of the worst things you can do is you love this tree 
and your builder says, yeah, yeah, we'll protect it. We'll wrap some two by fours around it. Then they trench, they drive all over it. And then five years later, the tree dies. Well, the builder's gone. You've already paid him, but he killed your tree. So as a homeowner, you didn't have the knowledge to say, no, this is how I'm going to take this example the city's giving me. This is how we protect a tree. This is how to do it responsibly. If you're going to do it, you have to do it 100%. You can't 80% protect the tree. It's dead. You might as well 10% protect it because you're going to get the same outcome. It just might just take a little longer. So kind of the way the trees die, we're talking about removing the roots, less roots, less leaves, less leaves, less energy, less roots. And so it's a process. The tree slowly falls apart. And you've probably seen that in trees all over the place. So all of a sudden this tree, the top, the top of the tree dies. Next year there's less canopy. There's less canopy, less canopy, less canopy, less canopy. It's on a downward spiral. All that started from somebody building a new driveway, somebody trenching for new irrigation, somebody dumping, accidentally dumping concrete around the base of a tree and creating a huge hard layer. And these things have an impact, but it takes it a long time to kill a tree. So first we have to let people know how to do it properly. Um, we could suggest having that information published somewhere whether it's a web page or in building documents, if you choose to protect a tree, this is how we recommend you do it. Um, and whether we want to look at looking at something where people pay, I know there's a credit system for the city of Inglewood. I'm not 100% sure how that works, what the credit goes towards. Um, but doing a system where, okay, you're going to remove these trees, okay, we're going to charge you for removing these trees and that money goes directly back into reforesting that same district, that same neighborhood. Right, so we can use that money to buy trees, put them in the parks, put them on the streets, distribute it to people that want to plant trees in that neighborhood. So we have the funding. Um, and yeah, and this is where I just put ideas what other people think. I have like a, I have my own view on it as a forestry professional, but ultimately it's up to the people that live in the city to decide what they want, how they value their own forest, how they think, what, what they think their role is in their neighbor's tree. Should they have a role? Do you have a say in your neighbor's tree? Do you have a say and the trees being bulldozed at the new apartment complex? And that's that's the question. Some cities choose to say no. Some cities choose to say yes, 100%. But there's a medium ground that, that we should all find, I think. So that's where, if y'all have any thoughts, I'd love to hear them. Yeah. Do we want to open it for discussion? Yeah, for 100%. What people think? I had a question. Everybody jumped in, whatever. Uh, when I distill this down, you're, we're basically talking about zoning and we're talking about uh, affecting growth and development in the city. And I, I hear you, there's a diversity of opinions on save every tree versus chop every tree down, et cetera. Uh, the process is what I'm curious about right now because um, the role of sustainability commission, I mean, we would have debates amongst ourselves. We all consider ourselves sustainable type people, um, but how would you hope it would go? How would you hope the sustainability commission could chime in? Could get the ball rolling or could be part of that ball roll? Like I'm thinking it's going to take time for the process to unfold. But what you said, for example, just guidelines for a homeowner. I mean, I learned a lot just here. I didn't know about that versus that. And so um, I think I'm speaking for this group. I think we would want to participate in some way. <laughs> so how would you hope we might be able to participate 
and how would you envision a process? I think the way this board would participate is that you have been given a, a voice, a seat in the discussion from the council. <clears throat> this is where this came to, okay? and they've asked this group for a recommendation or some sort of like, Mel, how would you describe what they asked for comment? Yes, yeah, comments, suggestions, recommendations. Suggestions. Yeah. If you all have any, if you if you want to, this is also totally up to you all. If you want to produce recommendations, you all have autonomy. This is something you don't want to do. You all don't have to. Yeah, so I think that I could I could send an email to our director every week. Tree protection, tree protection, tree protection. It doesn't go anywhere. Right. But this group has been given the voice. Yeah, I would say this is this is one where council explicitly said yeah. we want advice from. So okay. I would say, you know, from council perspective, um, we would be a bit disappointed if you came back and said no comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this, never mind. Like this, this is actually kind of quasi a mandate from council <laughs> that uh, you give us some recommendations on it, which is really great. Okay. Coming from my perspective. This group has been given the voice that I that I, that I don't have, but and that's and that's just how okay. no. and that's just how government works. So I would hope that this group takes the opportunity to really look at this, and since they have been, let's say, mandated to do suggestions, recommendations, really, you know, put some thought into it, make a really informed recommendation, and push it as hard as you can while you have opportunity because that opportunity doesn't doesn't come like from my opinion this is only the third time that i've ever been involved where the people making the decisions have asked usually you're just constantly just <laughs> punching can i ask where where did this originate did it start with you this originated from council and yeah, this was from uh, this came out of our code next discussion um, I think at our most our, our last study session on that, where um, Chelsea brought it up, and she said, "Could we consider some tree protections within Code Next rewrite?" And my response, among I think other council members, was, "Maybe you know, with this is something we need to do, but maybe it's not. It's a little too late in the game to include it in Code Next. Let's refer it to." Sustainability Commission to come up with some recommendations and consider it for a tree, you know, a tree ordinance later on. So it sounds was a little behind Code Next. That's why I it came that. very late in the game. Yeah. yeah so we 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 were. You know, okay. This is something I think would fall fall within the develop development code, um, right. in Title 16, right. but it would it's not going to be a part of the Code Next process. It would be a subsequent process. I think some low hanging fruit is the city. City right away is is on people's property. Those trees, I think, could be easily protected without questioning, you know, without bringing up the who owns it question. Uh, we're, we're letting you use it, but we own it. It'd be one easy place to introduce greater tree protection. Another one, I think, we'd have more trees survive irrigation projects if people just knew. I think what you just laid out with the where to trench and where not to trench would be extremely helpful just to edge Yeah, it. I was like, oh, I hope I didn't kill myself. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a few yeah, years now and the tree's still there. I used to do like consulting, walk up and you're just like, you, you killed, like, you loved your tree so much, you killed it. Like, you can't do that. They're like, well, what can I do to fix it? Nothing. If, if I walk over and cut your arm off and go throw your arm, the car in the garbage. What, are you going to grow another one? <laughs> Luckily, trees can grow new roots, but it's it's too late. Mature trees, trees are like people. The older you get, the less you want change. Yeah. And so you suddenly do something, add stuff, you put soil on top of them. They're very sensitive. Yeah, it's been there for 100 years. You do, you can kill it in 30 seconds. Yeah, that's that's good. I think education will be huge for the private trees. And I don't I know what the method is, but that's well, that's low hanging fruit right there that, that, you know, the information that you provided. I think we all kind of did an aha moment. Um, if we could, you know, put that as a, as a piece 
of it, I think that makes sense. The other thing I think is that we kind of need to separate maybe public and private in terms of our, you know, sort of discussion here, because I think that, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about how, how, how invasive do you get with people's properties? You know, that whole, your whole story um, is a good example. But I think that in terms of public, oh, next moving forward on some of the zone zoning issues you mentioned, that's something that we could have a, a strong effect with. And I think that from peers like Wood and Littleton that I've talked to, they are targeting development because the people developing these commercial properties, obviously Lakewood and Littleton are different. There's a lot more development going on there than in Eaglewood, but these are the people that are coming in, building something and leaving. They're not really, the people, the companies building are not part of the community. So they're easy targets because they're not, they're not voters. They're not really shareholders in the community. They're coming in, they're building whatever it is, commercial property, apartment buildings, condos, whatever, and they're out. So these developers are, are also an easy target to influence them in a good way to either protect trees or as a source for funding to reforest neighborhoods that get decimated by development. And I would, uh, one of the thoughts that occurred to me as you were talking, you mentioned Boston or other places where they have such restrictive um, tree ordinances that that it, it really puts a damper on on development. I immediately, you know, think macro and say, what does that, what does that actually accomplish, you know? Um, because if you, I mean, it's, if you, if you say we're going to have such, such restrictive ordinance here that nobody can build anything, are you actually doing the environment any favors in the big picture? Because aren't they going to build somewhere? Are they going to go out, you know, is it going to cause more sprawl? Are they going to go build their apartments further, further out? Are they going to, you know, so I, I think that, that, you know, talking about that balance is maybe important because yes, maybe you save some trees in your neighborhood, but what are you doing, you know? Um, those kind of, if you have an urban area, that's that's a good place to potentially develop, but you want to save your trees so much that you push the development further out um, and cause cause that further sprawl. Are you really solving any problems or are you just moving it around to a different community? That's exactly yeah. the, the suburbs of Austin, yeah. Brown Rock, Pflugerville, wherever. Yep. They don't have the same protections. So, those so the developers go yeah, out there and you get yeah. a spreading of the city overall. Yeah. And, and it's on purpose. Austin doesn't want it. So go over there and do it. If you're not going to do it here. Go do it in Fluver. That's the other thing is that occurred to me like, you know, any for some people who don't want to see any development in a city, this is just another tool, you know, and that's another and tool it, to use. That's what it is. But the other side of that point, you can make a super restrictive <laughs> ordinance, then this will keep the development out and keep. That, and and I think cities. that's where this group can contribute because your points are well taken, Joe. The other side of the coin is you can create a tree ordinance that creates a design challenge for a designer. So if, if we said, OK, you're going to tear down a 150 year old oak tree to put in a triplex. You need to put in <coughs> four oak trees of a diameter of X because we're looking at that corner for the next 50 years. So there's a give and a take there so that uh, I'm making this up, but I'm thinking a tree ordinance could also put the incentive or the design challenge in front of the developer. If you want to build that here, your landscaping <coughs> and your tree strategy affects whether we will permit it. And we want, we want trees in Englewood. Some trees have got to go, but that doesn't mean we can't encourage designing and planting yeah. new trees. So, so I think there is a balance. Yeah. Um, a, yeah. Another thought that I had was we could go on all night. This is fascinating. It really is. But one of my thoughts is um, my background in planning was always starting with a vision, you know, a vision for trees in Englewood for the next 50 years. Well, that's fun because you can just imagine utopia, you know. And then you create a vision statement or a vision paragraph or whatever of we would envision this tree canopy in Englewood or what have you. 
Now that would take us some time to even agree on what that vision, but I would like to think we could get the ball rolling. So if we if we work on some long range vision for trees in Englewood, and then the other thing we could do is we could play with some granular statements, such as we want to do some protection on trees that are over 100 years old. We're not saying no trees can be cut, but for example, in my neighborhood, I have two neighbors that have absolutely beautiful trees. I mean, they are just there's there's one. It's I believe it's a blue spruce, and it's got to be the circumference on that thing's got to be 10 feet, if not bigger. And it just goes straight up. It's beautiful. And it's on private property. But the thought of somebody cutting that down to, to put a fourplex in makes me wonder, you know. But we could grapple with some of those statements, like sentences or phraseology, to say, generally speaking, these are the kinds of things we'd like to see, and these are the kinds of things we'd not like to see. And maybe that could get us thinking. And I'd love to have you chime in, review, educate us as we build that vision. But there's nothing stopping us from putting our ideas in writing. And, and there's nothing stopping us from debating amongst ourselves whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. I don't want to study this for the next six years. You know, if we're going to get involved, let's try to do something, put something in writing. And I suspect we can come up with something. Uh, a starting it's a, point. It's a we're just reinventing the wheel. All of this that we're talking about is happening all over uh -huh. the world right now. It's already whatever plan Inglewood comes up with, somebody else is already doing. It. So we don't have to right. get real crazy. But to your point, you have to be really pragmatic about how you go about these things. Because if you come out and say certain things in certain ways, you're going to shut people off immediately. They won't be in your corner anymore. And when it comes to trees, everybody loves trees. That's great. Like I say, my mom, she would report her neighbor immediately <laughs> if she sees them trimming the tree without a permit. Oh, but she'll go to her tree. That's, the <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> I mean, that's how, that's just human yeah. nature. Yeah. So you have to be, you have to realize that people want to protect the big blue screws, but maybe the person who owns that tree does that. That's, yeah, that's true. It's their tree. You know, it, and it's, it's yeah. their tree. So you have to be, you know, take soft steps and, and pick your battles and, and you don't want to discourage development. You want to encourage sustainable development. You want to encourage proper development. You know, one, it's, we don't really have this in Inglewood, but imagine if there was like a huge sort of tree lot, five acres that somebody owned for a long time and then oh they pass away the family sells it and then they they bulldoze all of it and it was all full of trees it was this beautiful green space yes it was private but it provided benefits mm -hmm. to the entire block to the entire neighborhood like, where do you draw the line so, and that's that's our point we Inglewood wants to develop you know they want to have people be allowed to build on their properties. But to what point? I think that's why a lot of these cities are targeting commercial and high density. They're not targeting single family homes. Because those yep. those are the voters. Those are the people that the, the policymakers are put there to work for. Right. You no, know, it's when people come in, they build apartments and things like that. Like that's fine. But that's not always the most environmentally friendly type of development. What's the feeling of the group? What, what, what should we do or not do? Are there any steps we ought to tiptoe into this or should we think about it for a few more months? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of logic in evaluating when it's most appropriate to introduce, um, where to introduce the ordinances. And obviously, when something's changing very obviously, like new development is a more natural place than to show up and say, hey, neighbors, watch for each other. Make sure you don't trim trees without a permit. It would be draconian and painful. You wouldn't want to. That's, the, that's, a, that's a bridge too far. So I think, yeah, I think trying to trying to figure out that place where we can. But, but I do think 
neighborhood like yours, neighborhood like mine, where the trees are beautiful, you say, people would say, would like to know that you just killed your tree by irrigating, by building that ir irrigation. That, so something around the education and the existing, something around the ordinance, around the city right of way, city parks, and city uh, and new development. Um, that's that's thoughtful because um, death by a thousand cuts kills developments too. We say every four inch tree must be protected. Um, may, that may not seem like a big deal, but if it's a thousand here and a thousand there and a thousand here, developers just say never mind. I'm blowing up those ranch. Yeah. So all or of those tear out a whole gone. bunch of trees. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and uh, so all of those imbalance, I think there's there's something really helpful here, and and I I'm optimistic that. Um, I, I don't have a utopian view that education solves all the world problems. What you just said, I think, related to the the critical root zone, would be tree saving for people who just have um, just didn't know any better. And that's yeah. that's good. And I, the thing I was thinking of was um, some sort of um, we've renamed all the neighborhoods. Somebody in each one of those neighborhoods who's an activator. The next door person that everyone listens to and doesn't get annoyed by can say, "Hey, I'm I'm hosting the the urban forester at a party on Saturday. Everybody come here about how to make our neighborhood more better treat, right? I think that kind of thing would actually gain traction, at least in my neighborhood, better than uh, new ordinance. We're watching you. That's exactly what you don't want to do. Yeah, and you'd be surprised how many parties they go to and spend the whole time answering tree questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's why, you know, these, these are just some ideas that I threw out there. These are both very common things that are happening all over the place, especially in Colorado. Um, these two ideas, whether it's protecting public trees, just like you talked about the right of which Inglewood really doesn't have that. So there's a few blocks just south of Yale that have them, and it's sort of intermixed. Inglewood just doesn't have a lot of that strip. So there's not a lot of public right of way trees. Um, so, which is good for us because it, you have to have the infrastructure to enforce all this. If you do start protecting all public <coughs> trees, uh, but you've got to have something out there. So when somebody's getting a permit for remodeling their house, they have to like see this, so that at least they know came back like, okay, this is, you're going to protect that tree in your backyard. This is what you need to do. Yeah. So education can right. help. At least have it, forcing them to look at it at some point. Yeah, that's right. And then the payment process is, is very common. It's a, it's a way to get additional funding. We're not talking about huge amounts of money, you know, in a lot of places that have like this $1,200 for a tree. Well, the developers just bulldoze it and pay the fine. It's easier than going through the process. Let's we'll just do it after the fact. So that's really common. And then the money goes to right into reforestation projects. I see that as really the benefit of that fund of like, OK, if you don't want the tree and you're a developer, no one's saying that you have to keep it and that the community still wins, too, because then you get a plant somewhere else. And it just it doesn't have to be right there. I definitely like that as an alternative to you cannot build here because there's because right. there's a four, oh, four inch tree, yeah, or a four foot tree. Well, and I think the the idea of having a, I don't know what we have in terms of an urban forest plan or strategic, you know, you know, tree canopy plan for the whole city, or if we need to adopt something like that. But you know, you wouldn't worry about every little tree if you know every year we're adding, you know, right. so many tens or hundreds of new trees every year. Um, and, you know, it, that would be awesome if, uh, you know, 25 years from now, a 25 year plus mm -hmm. tree was a dime a dozen. Oh, if we lose that one, it's OK. We have, yeah. you know, we have we're just covered with them everywhere. Right. And to have a plan like that makes each tree um, in this individual tree is less like mission critical. Exactly. When we have the whole plan, the whole master plan in place. Yeah. And the ordinance is just to aid in, you know, if you're going to have some fee for commercial development, that that's there to make to, to provide at least one funding source towards executing the master 
you know, tree canopy plan or whatever it yeah. is. And ultimately, that's the goal. So, like, Bart says, our Arbor Day tree sale, where we had 78 trees sold to the community this year, but we take a big hit. You know, we buy them for 75, sell them for 35. You know, so that's coming out of our budget to do that. If we had additional funding, we can make the trees cheaper mm -hmm. and provide more of them to you and then get more on that line where we're replacing trees privately. We can mm -hmm. only plant so many trees in the parks. We can't just mm -hmm. have a forest. It's mm -hmm. multi-use areas. But getting trees into the hands of the homeowners that want them is the most important part and also the hardest part. Yeah. And subsidizing trees is one of the best ways to do it. Make them cheap. We've added five trees to our yard from the Arbor Day, so every, you know, you can't, every you can't we, we right. ran out of room, so we don't have, <laughs> yeah, we don't have any places left to put that's trees a good problem in my yard. Yeah. And, 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 but, and, and they're starting to get big now from five or six years ago. So yeah, they you know, and that's the point of the program. So, but these programs need funding. And if there was a change in park leadership and they said, hey, I, we're not cool with eating $8,000 every year on this. Well, you need an additional funding source, maybe. This is a way to provide that. Yeah, that's great. So there's entire cities that their entire reforestation budget. This is where it comes from. And I like your district comment. If, if a development goes in that took out three trees and six need to be planted, if homeowners would be, this tree is, is donated to you because you've got the right property for it or, or in your, in this district. We just go like next door, like yeah. wherever those trees are removed. You can outreach. Say, yeah. Would you like a tree? I like that. Would you like a tree? These are our preferred species. developers giving you this tree. <laughs> we will drop it off at your house. Yeah. We will show you how to plant it. Awesome. So I have a question for Joe. So my understanding, so it's it's not this committee's job to actually like write the ordinance. There's that like, would be written it would be written by a legal department. So like yeah. our our task is to sort of come up with as you said, like a recommendation on here are the boundaries of, you know, what we feel as, you know, members of the community representing the community, like would be a reasonable ask, you know, for council to put forward to, you know, put something in place, right? Yeah, I, I would see it as kind of, you know, bullet points, like, you know, we want reforestation plan, we want, you know, reasonable fee for developers and just mm -hmm. throwing out ideas that it sounds like people are agreeable, you know, um, and even throw out numbers for what those could be. We want, you know, but no, no, no residential requirement, you know, re, you know, replanting within districts, those kind of things like, okay. you, know, you know, and then, you know, I imagine at some point we'll have a study session and maybe we'll have somebody, you know, have Mike or whoever come in and present the ideas to city council and the city council will take that input and then give direction to staff to, to okay. write up the ordinance. Yeah, that's what I just wanted to be clear on because between this committee and another one I've been on, I've been down the rabbit hole of the group trying to actually write right. the code. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm like, that's uh, not our asking. job. That's yeah, not the ask. Like, code, man, it's, yeah, <laughs> we have, like, but enforcement like, committee is a little challenging. <laughs> but, but that would be very similar to the other memos that the commission has. Yeah. Made, just very recommendation. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm in a huge yeah. fan of this. I think, you know, I'm kind of disappointed that the city doesn't have something in place already. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm in favor of moving forward on this on the quicker, Is that a motion? quicker spectrum <laughs> rather than the longer spectrum, you know, next couple months um, would be ideal. I think, you know, after just having this educational session, thank you, Evan, for presenting. Um, the further we get away from it, I just feel like the information gets lost and, you know, things get forgotten about, fall through the cracks, like whatever I think. You know, while it's fresh, we should kind of act on it. So yeah. Okay. So Joe, what would what would you think would be a reasonable response if we were to communicate back to City Council, which is thank you for asking for our opinion. Um, we will have an opinion guidelines or our best thoughts back to you in two months or three months or two weeks or what? What do you think? Would make I think sense. A, a couple of months is a couple months, two or three months is fine. What, however much time it 
you know, used to take, but with monthly meetings, I would expect it to take a couple of months. Joe, I was thinking around the two to three mark. Yeah. I think would be good. Is there, in, is there anything in the new what's moving forward as code next that addresses this at all? Um, I know we've we've talked about it and I've seen it coming about as you know when the, the committee put together, but we don't have anything that, that you know is already it'd be nice to know what's already there. I don't believe there's any uh, about trees in, in the code next. I would That's imagine it's just the continuation of what's already in. There is a lot of tree related it's stuff. already stuff in, in the front. Right. 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 How many trees are we supposed to have and spacing and under this and far away from this and all that? It's all in there. There is landscape landscaping types of require, you know, and green space requirements for developments and stuff like that, but not tree protect, you know, anything tree protect protection specifically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I always like to call it. Tree protection is like a very common term people think of, but I always call it tree preservation. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're not just trying to protect it, we're trying to preserve it. So I think it's I think of protection is like a shield. And the preservation is like we're trying to like not just not hurt it, we're trying to like keep it alive. Yeah, the, the logo for the city is a tree. I've been looking at that the whole I'm time. I'm staring at like it right now. Inglewood has a really great Tree canopy. It's a small city. Like I said, there's a limited amount. Um, like I have done a tree canopy survey for, for the city. Hopefully, we'll be doing another one soon. There are limited areas where trees can even grow in you, know, you have huge sort of industrial areas. You have lots of roads. You have lots of parking lots. Lots of huge buildings. And so the areas we can grow trees are relatively small. City. Small yards, small houses. It's not, it's, you know, you look at a map, you look at Inglewood, and you go, it's probably a bad example, but you look at Cherry Hills, and it's just dark green. It's big yards, they can have big trees spaced out. Inglewood's never going to be on that level. So, where we do have trees, that it's important to do what we can to multiply those trees and make sure those good ones we have stay there. So what spaces are those? Is it mostly development, like what you said, or for not more single family houses? In Cherry Hills? In Inglewood in general. Like where should we be focusing on? That, that, that's a great question. So that was part of like the canopy survey. Like where are we missing? Yeah. Okay, and then start looking down at why are we missing it there? Well, we're missing there because there's nowhere to plant trees. Because the yards are too small. There's too much hardscape. Trees need space as well. So we can plant we can plant the tree in this tiny yard, it's never gonna get big. So will it stop growing? Or will it just die? Yeah, it's just like putting an alligator in a fish tank. Eventually it just can't grow anymore. Right. And it either dies or it just stays tiny. Okay. And so you'll just never develop right. big big trees. And that's part of the problem with development. As yards get smaller, you can't support big trees anymore. It's physically impossible. Hmm. So, like I said, if you could talk about it for hours, I yeah. guess my sort of final point will be that um, like I'm here as like the city's forester, the city's tree expert. Um, I'll be a resource for y'all as y'all go through this at any point. You can reach out to me about any questions or want me to look at something or think about something. That's what that's what I'm here for. I have my own opinions, but I think the opinion of this group is going going to add a little bit more weight since you have been tasked with this. And I would say that as a tree professional, I hope that what comes out of this is something that can move this discussion and project forward. Take the first step on what is going to be a multi-step journey get even close to where we could be. But so while while I'm striking while the iron's hot, while they're asking for your opinion, give it. Is there kind of general consensus from the group that this is something and we want to look at two to three months and then provide some recommendations? I, I, yes. I think yes. Yes. All those who are generally positive. Right now. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, uh, which say, shouldn't we sketch and look at the next couple of meetings? Up on the screen. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure that uh, it's on a, a block of time so that we can put ideas. Absolutely. And I, I was wondering, Bill, uh, staying within the parameters and the guidelines of our communications, um, <laughs> could we could we invite ourselves to send to you bullet points, thoughts, sentences, paragraphs, because the way I sometimes I just get thinking and I and I would for one like to just send it to you. And then maybe if others did that, you might even compile it into yeah. a very, very rough summary of here are some ideas you guys sent me and then we could talk off of that initial piece of paper. I think that would be great. I think it would make conversation even more yeah. efficient and faster. It's easier to speak off of something than to just keep it up to the stratosphere. Yeah. I have a question for you. Do you you have sources that you were going through for some of the cities? Do they actually have this within their within their uh, ordinances? Is there could you possibly provide some links or something like that so we can maybe review some of those things? That's a great I, idea. I can. Uh, I was just Google searching and going through like the, you know, the little code websites that have every single city's code and cleaning code on them and just search the word trees. Oh, like that's that's what I was doing. I mean, these documents are. Yeah, it's a lot and it's in it's in a lot of different areas because you have about vegetation, you have about planning, you have about landscape and it's in different parts of city codes. Uh, so if you said Boulder City Code Tree. If you say Boulder City Codes, it will take you to a website. You open up that link and then out the search box, you just put trees. And then it's, you're going to have 10,000, like Boulder, you have know, like 40,000 results for all their different tree stuff. You go to Lakewood, you get the same thing. Inglewood, you'll get the same thing. That's how I went through our plan. It's in multiple different sections. And, and if you up. said Houston, you wouldn't get anything. Well, you would. Yeah. Somebody follows it. <laughs> <laughs> Plastic trees. Anyway, no, that's helpful. Yeah, a lot of a lot of tree ordinances get lip service, and that's just the reality. Well, thank you, Evan. Is there any other questions or anything we need to? Oh, thank you very much, nice. Evan. While we've got him here, I'm going to get him some biochar so he can get him some biochar. The city already paid for it, so yeah, have fun. He he makes his own, so he can he can lecture us on that. But this has been very helpful. And I, I think, I think we've got some energy here, and we might want to put some yeah. thoughts on writing and get back to the council with some ideas. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm a resource for this group. No matter what, no matter what it is, I've written tree ordinances before. Okay. Not for a city, for smaller groups, HOAs, universities, things like that. But they're really no different. Nobody here is gonna. Well, maybe we will. Probably yeah. won't. Probably won't come up with an idea that nobody's ever thought of before. So feel free to see what other cities are doing. Okay. Other cities in Colorado. Other cities in <laughs> the country. Basically, everybody just copies mm -hmm. bits and pieces that everybody else is. That's sort of how it works. That's okay. If it's a good idea, it's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you all for having me. We may have to have to come back to us <laughs> and review our work. Anytime. All right. Thank you. All right. So next thing up um, is the mid-year sustainability update. With it being June, we thought this would be a good time. It's directly half of the year. Um, so I was going to go over some of the accomplishments that we have, some things to look forward to for the rest of the year, and then we we're going to jump into past grants, budget stuff, a lot of fun things coming up. So. Accomplishments for this year. I just want to give a huge shout out to Mike for his biochar project. He did such a great job with the three acres up there, and hopefully you all are able to go over to the Englewood Recreation Center. See them, and thank you everyone for- um, Flowers look really good over there. Mm -hmm. They look beautiful. Well, and thank you, Rick and uh, Iana and Mel and Matthew. Matthew, you're quiet. We're still thinking of you. <laughs> Everybody rolled up their sleeves and it was it was fun. I enjoyed it. Thanks for your help. <laughs> we also had uh, the adoption of the electric vehicle action plan in April. We had already had a few community events, the residential energy efficiency one that the commission put on. We had quite a few EV events. 
Um, in the very, very beginning of the year, we had the completion of the municipal greenhouse gas inventory. These inventories get done about like every three years. If you do them every year, it just doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really add that much. So those will be done in another three ish years. Um, we also had the launching of the garden in a box program and the lawn replacement program. That garden in a box, um, all of those got scooped up, I want to say in a week. That was so, so popular. The lawn replacement programs in full swing, lots of um, applications and a few lawns already replaced already, which is really exciting. Um, we launched the compost drop off at the Englewood Recreation Center. Um, we had our first ever Englewood centered Earth Day event. I know South Platte Renew puts them on, but that's kind of a conjoined Littleton Englewood one. So this was our first <laughs> one the city specific one. We began our energy performance contract process and for a high level of what this is, we have a contractor that came in and they're doing a full energy audit of every single building, um, municipal Englewood building. They're also, I'm going to touch on this a little bit later. They also really do a great job of helping us look for grants that can help um, cover a big chunk of change for the retrofits that will save us a lot of money in the future too. Um, and then this, the last two are really exciting ones. So we submitted, um, not even a month ago, a request for a regional waste characterization study between the city of Englewood, the city of Littleton, um, city of Centennial and uh, Sheridan. So um, this essentially is with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, they have their front range waste diversion program, which we had applied to last year and didn't get a grant um, from them. But they created this sub program called TASP. It's like technical assistant something program. Um, and we all got together in the region. And we noticed a big lack in kind of information around waste for the front range, especially, especially in South Denver. So we submitted this application. If we get it, it would be 100% completely free. It would just cost us really staff time throughout cities to do it. And essentially what they do is um, they have staff go out um, on their end through TAS, it has technical assistance. They go out actually to landfills and they say, okay, this is coming from Englewood, this is coming in from Littleton, and they organize what it is. So we can really truly say like our green neck waste is like 30% of our waste, we can we really need programs for this, or, or we really are noticing we have high um, high high plastic or high cardboard. So it'll really give us good data going forward. I will say the people from the state were really excited too because um, as you all probably know, we're lacking a lot of infrastructure in Colorado, especially in the front range uh, for like recycling hazardous waste. It's just a huge issue across the board. So they see this potentially if we get it, which we don't know yet, um, kind of helping to further show that we need more infrastructure around here to help us do what we need to do. So that's really exciting. We applied for that. Hopefully um, we'll have news in the next month or two if we got it. And then our final one, we actually just completed this last Thursday. We did an internal resiliency workshop with the Colorado Resiliency Office. Um, and this essentially was myself, the emergency risk manager, um, Eric White from the county, who we also contract with for Englewood, um, and some key level staff who really know the challenges that the city faces, both short and long term, such as like homelessness, a cybersecurity attack, extreme weather events. Um, and we all got together and we really talked about what the challenges for the city of Englewood specifically are. And we did this because it directly ties to one of our sustainability plan projects, which is very broad um, and very big, which is to increase climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies, which how the state defines it, it's kind of like this climate change on the outside, which is really this driver to all these kind of smaller problems that we're seeing, a very systems kind of approach to it. Um, so with that, for upcoming events, going off that resiliency one, we really want um, kind of what the resilience framework that we're going to have created, hopefully at either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year, to not just be city staff identifying challenges, but also to go to the community and say, what do you all see as some short long term challenges and what are some strategies you would like to see the city take to address them? <coughs> uh, so we're still working on kind of um, synthesizing all the uh, internal staff uh, notes and everything because again this happened just last Thursday um, and then we're going to plan a community event to invite everyone in to really help shape what this kind of framework looks like going forward. 
Um, any questions on that one before I move forward? I know that one. Putting a task group together or something once you get that that shaped or how, how is that working? Yeah, so for the internal one at least, the first workshop really was identifying our top challenges that we're facing. And then I gave um, some staff some homework, which I'm sure they loved, but they actually loved the workshop. Um, where over the next six weeks, they have to work kind of with their team to identify one to three feasible strategies that we could actually do. Um, and then we're gonna take those notes. We're gonna ask the community first what they think, just so our opinions don't muddle what they think or, or take away any creativity. And then at the end of that event, we're gonna say, okay, like this is, this is what we had. How can we kind of mesh all these together? For what that'll look like, it's still TBD. We're kind of making it very flexible just because um, we didn't know how the workshop was going to come out. We didn't know kind of like the information we were going to get, um, but we're going to have kind of an internal team helping us with the community um, event. But I could definitely see the Sustainability Commission helping also with it because we want to make sure that we reach as much people as possible um, to get their feedback on it. Great, and then we have upcoming the household hazardous waste and electronic recycling that tentatively is for September 9th and 16th. Um, we also have one of the things in the sustainability plan is the low income energy efficiency outreach and education plan and strategy. There's been a lot of work on what that draft plan will be like. We're hoping in August to bring it in front of the sustainability commission for you all to give your feedback on it. Um, so far, we've done a lot of interviews with nonprofit stakeholders, so like Mile High Youth Corps, Energy Outreach Colorado, um, all in grid alternatives, all those that are really in that field to kind of help us get data of also what have we already done in the past and where are our gaps and how can we be better. Um, the next one is an employee green commute pilot program. This is also in the sustainability plan to explore. So we've been working with um, Dr. Cog, which does everyone know Dr. Cog is? When I first started, I was just like, who the heck is this? So Dr. Cog stands for Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, and they are, a non, are they a nonprofit, Joe? A quasi-governmental? It's quasi-governmental. Quasi-governmental. And you're actually not supposed to call it Dr. Cog anymore because really? somebody sued. Oh, so never. I mean, I'm not. So, so you give a your to Joseph Cog. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's some other Dr. Cog out there who didn't like that. Uh, That's hilarious. Well, well, hopefully, he doesn't see us recording it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we've been. <laughs> yeah, he does. Doctor in town. No, no, oh my God. You learn something new every day, let me tell you. Um, they do a lot of work uh, regionally with communities, um, and so they have a kind of a green commute platform. It's completely free. We've actually already been using a little bit to kind of incentivize people or not incentivize, encourage people to uh, take greener commutes to work. We've been kind of partnering them on um, getting clean commute certified. It's a program that they have also free, um, and we kind of looked at the data of um, where our employees are generally located and what makes the most sense um, for a green commute program. Because I know some communities, they just kind of buy a whole thing of eco passes and throw it out to people and say, there you go. But we actually found that that probably wouldn't have even been the best route for our employees going forward. So it's nice to have that data. Um, so we've been working with them on their platform to do uh, potentially kind of like this incentivizing a dollar per trip. Um, program for for Anglewood employees where you know if you'd like to work you get a dollar that you'll see on your paycheck maybe in a month or something um, and I'll talk about this also in a little bit but the state currently has an alternative transportation option tax so if um, you know entities local governments included start this program you actually get 50 percent of your money back uh, for starting a program like this so it significantly helps with costs which is nice uh, the next one is we are one project away from reaching bronze soul smart designation, which is really nice. Um, the max you can get is gold. So, I mean, we're going to continue chugging away, but it's nice that we'll hopefully most likely be designated at the end of the year. Tiana, I know you started after. Do you know what the soul smart program is? Do you want a high level? Okay. 
The Soul Smart program uh, is a free program to local governments. It's through the Department of Education. And essentially what you do when you sign up is they provide you a free technical assistant um, person to chat with. And they have kind of a, a point system where if you do certain projects and complete them, you get points to either get bronze, silver, or gold. And then you get recognition for being part of the program. The economic benefit of going through this is that when you say you're kind of a soul smart program, you're signaling to like solar companies and everything that you're an easier community to work with if they want to do solar for like residential or businesses. Um, so it helps in that way. Um, and it's also very fascinating. One of the things was actually um, working with your fire department for uh, solar safety. If there's fire, obviously that all those materials and the solar panels are not that safe. Um, and apparently Denver doesn't have that already. I have a safety treaty for that. So I was like, you're welcome. Let's get that started. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that'll hopefully be done at the end of the year. And then finally, um, we're looking at about an August launch date for an internal city green team um, of having someone from each department to really help us um, push forward even further with finding some projects um, in the city. We have uh, the paper process one already in the sustainability plan. Um, so helping with that, which that could save a lot of money if we reduce our paper, which would be great. And then other ways just to inspire employees to really want to be um, be involved and be a part of, uh, of the green team. So that's all for the updates. Any questions or any comments before I move on? Great. Um, so Tim told me that uh, folks also wanted to. Oh, sorry, it's not this one. Next is going over the sustainability uh, budget enhancement review. So um, this is going to be going uh, each year. You do kind of a budget enhancement every department um, in front of city council for the year 2024. You can recommend stuff. It doesn't mean that's going to happen, but you can put it up there and just see if it will. Um, so this will go in front of City Council on June 26th. And so these are the highlights of the ones for sustainability specifically. The first one is um, covering half the cost of an air quality sensor. So we're currently in the Love My Air program. Um, and this has been completely free. It's a regional approach with us in other cities and other counties. Um, we It's getting very popular. We just got a grant that the group did and so they're trying to expand and they're asking those who are part of um, the group to slowly start the self funding process. So there's room for other communities to come on with the sensors as well, especially communities that it would just not be feasible for them to afford it. So three thousand uh, dollars covers one sensor and a year of the platform. Um, that it's currently on, which it's currently active. It's been active um, and I can send it out to folks too if they're curious to see it. We moved our sensors um, per city council's request. And I totally agreed with it. We're getting a lot more interesting data um, to Cushing's Park and to the Northwest Greenbelt. And you're seeing a lot of interesting data of when that air quality is actually becoming in the red zone instead of the green zone. So pretty interesting stuff. and. Um, so that's our first pitch. Our, and also this is in no uh, uh, order of priority. It's just up there as is. The second one is a sustainability fellow program. And so this would make it where uh, for the sustainability program, we get two fellows, so one in the beginning of the year and one in the end of the year. And this is mainly to help us uh, push ahead of accomplishing the progress, the projects and the plan. Uh, which there are a lot. We went after a lot of the low hanging fruit kind of in my first year. It just made sense to get momentum. Some of the ones that are remaining kind of like a lead abatement program uh, to financially help residents, you know, those are bigger and they take a lot of time. So having the assistance of fellows to really help us move forward is, is so, so needed and so, so important. So we're pitching for that. Uh, the third one is a sustainability grant program. Tim told me that this was also um, voiced by some people in the members of um, something that they wanted to see too, which I love to hear. This would essentially be very similar to the neighborhood resources grant program, uh, which has been really successful to be open to residents and businesses um, where if they wanted to accomplish some kind of sustainability program, um, they could get um, some funding through the city. Um, we're going to be talking about this kind of in the follow up 
um, someone has already come to the Sustainability Commission asking if they could, you know, use $500 for a project. If this was initiated, that would just be a place where they could go to instead of trying to pull funds. Um, else, and it would just make it a lot more organized. Um, so that's that pitch. The fourth one would be for the employee green commute program that I just talked about that pilot. It says 6,000, but truly it's 3,000 after you get that 50% back. And then the final one, um, this one is just a cost neutral one. I know we talked about it last year that the sustainability commission was not all that jazzed about having that very large hefty household hazardous waste budget. So this would be transferring the funds. Um, from you all under mine. I'm the one that oversees um, that. But anyways, nothing will really change. I'll still be doing all the stuff. It's just moving up the funds. Any questions? That's good. Great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all for on, on the uh, the six thousand dollars sustainability. If I'm understanding it right, if if somebody in the community came to us and said, we want to spend $1,000 on uh, planting trees in the park, would that mean we as a group could say yes or no? Or would we make a recommendation? We wouldn't write a check to somebody, but I mean, no, how, how would that flow? What, how would that work? I yeah, and so this is also kind of our, why we're requesting to move to funds too, because it just gets very confusing. So the Sustainability Commission as of now has this very large fund, mainly to cover that household hazardous waste and electronic equipment recycling event. We never truly know the exact dollar amount of what it's going to be after each year. It goes by weight, right. how much stuff people bring, which is why we have the co-pays to help cover it. It gets very dicey if you try to use those funds and mm -hmm. because at the end of the year, you could be next, say you, you want to do an $1,000 project. Well, that fund really isn't there for that. Exactly. It's there for that yeah. hazardous waste event and to cover those funds from that event. And so the six thousand dollars would give us something to work with, or imagine we could work with. So the seventy-six thousand really goes off the plate. It's going to go somewhere else in the city budget. So the six thousand wouldn't be just for the sustainability commission. Okay. Um, I mean, the details of it definitely need to be flushed out. This is just a very preliminary kind of idea bringing forward, but it wouldn't be here six thousand dollars for the sustainability commission. It would be housed in the city and residents or businesses, just like the neighborhood resources group would apply through that. But we can definitely talk about, you know, is there a way? I don't know if it would be allowed or not local government. I mean, government wise of like maybe someone on the sustainability commission sitting on um, the review committee when they look at grants or something. I mean, I'm not sure if that could happen, but maybe it could be an opportunity. Uh, but no, this wouldn't be six thousand dollars for the sustainability commission. Well, and that's that's my concern. And I'm not I'm not trying to create a budget for this commission. I'm trying to say either we have something to do with it or we don't. And I don't like being in the middle of we're sort of involved and we're not sort of involved. It's confusing to me. So so for example. As I remember the conversation of the six thousand dollars, it was wouldn't it be nice if at some point in time we had the ability to respond to a neighborhood group who approached us like like Dana did on the. Uh, I'm not saying that has to happen. What I'm saying is it's so darn confusing. Yeah, and so and I don't know what, what to, if a citizen says to me. Can you help us get five hundred dollars to plant a tree in our neighborhood park? I don't know how to answer that question. Really? I'd rather say, no, I can't help you right. than to say, maybe I can help you. You see what I'm getting at? I would, if it was me and Joe, tell me if I'm wrong, but as it is now, I would say, no, I mean, the sustainability can't promise anyone funds right. at all. So I would say no. Um, but that if the sustainability grant program was passed, you could direct them to that program. You could say, I personally can't, but there is something the city can do. And it's through this program. You could even say, yeah, we can help you go apply for the grant online. <laughs> well, I mean, exactly. But I'm just saying. Take credit for it. <laughs> Maybe I'm just slow, but in, in one way, it appears like we have a budget. In another way, we don't have a budget. And, and that's all I'm saying. The budget and I don't is, want a budget. <laughs> yeah, well, that because you all vocalized that before of like, please just remove this because it gets so confusing. 
and moving it won't change anything. The event will still happen, but yeah, having that, because every year that that end number, mm -hmm. that actual end number is going to be different because it's what the contractors give us for the event. So that's why we give it enough wiggle room to be okay, but truly there's no like extra funds there, which is what I was going to get to kind of at the end. We can jump a little forward with Dana's ask of that $500 for the bio blitz. Mm -hmm. Um, the parks department had talked to her and they were kind of like, maybe it would be a good thing under the sustainability commission. Here's the caveat though. And I talked to a few people to make sure I understood it correctly. You all can vote to say, yes, we want to use this $500. I think you all would have enough wiggle room maybe there to do it if you want to, but it all comes down to say at the end of the year, this household hazardous waste goes over budget or something. From my understanding, then you have to go to city council and say we're over budget. This is why we did this project and yada yada. So it's just, and what to say like we're sorry. Is there like a punishment? But it's I mean the five hundred dollars seems hurts every time. So Mel, but, uh, I'll, I'll and I will say one thing we, really quick. We do not have a budget. We can make recommendations. This commission does not have a budget. Is that a true statement? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then that, that's what we should yeah. say. That's all I'm trying to say. That's and the way it works. It should be noted too. Like I don't think most, if any, commissions have a budget. Like this is very a rare thing, so it shouldn't feel like oh we don't have a budget. Most commissions don't have a budget. This is very much an anomaly. It's caused a lot of confusion. So hopefully in 2024, that can be passed. <laughs> I know what I'm going to say. We don't have a budget. <laughs> we can make a recommendation, but we don't have a budget. And that's okay. Recommendations are strong. Yeah. Recommendations are strong. Yeah, no, I'm, that's fine. I just want clarity. Um, and the other thing is, I want to hear Kara talk too. So she's done some homework. So we're going to need to Let's move it along. <laughs> okay, so this is what Tim said people requested to see kind of the past grants that we applied for and what's going on in the future. I can make this very fast. Um, so in the end, this I want to say reflects only what me, a part timer sustainability person, applied to. This does not reflect the city or other sustainability <laughs> stuff. It's just me. Um, so last year we applied um, for the Healthy Babies Bright Future grant for $20,000 to, we submitted a letter of intent. Um, so not a grant, but a letter of intent to see if we could start a program for uh, uh, giving residents a hundred dollar rebate towards a lead abatement. We didn't get it only because they said they were flooded with applications actually all around lead abatement. So um, the other one, as most people know, we applied for that Colorado Department of Public Health uh, for the one year of the composting pilot project for all city buildings. We made it to the second round, they said no, but a positive thing of this year was, um, and I think I said this last year when we didn't get it, was that their notes were around, they wanted to see, see us either do a single hauler trash, or they wanted to see us do a waste characterization study before we asked for something like this. So us submitting that regional one would hopefully help us open up future funding with the forward program if we kind of get that stuff out of the way. Um, and then the current one, which we did get awarded, was through the Colorado Water Conservation Board for the lawn replacement program. So we get 50% of those funds back, i.e. utilities gets 50% of those funds back. And then potential future ones. Um, so as I said, our energy performance contractor, they're really looking for any and every grant available to help us pay for electrification and, and all the projects that could help us get a return on investment for these buildings. As I just said, the front range uh, waste diversion one would be more likely if we get the waste characterization one. Um, another one through the Colorado Department of Local Affairs is the Climate Resilience Challenge. They have about 20 million um, and DOLA actually is who we went through for that resilience workshop. So it, it would put us, we already went through the workshop with them. So hopefully that would put us in good graces with them. Um, and then there's the Charge Ahead Colorado grant from the Colorado Energy Office around um, EV chargings. And then finally, um, there is an opportunity with Excel Energy. They have a renewable energy trust fund, which is anywhere from fifteen to forty thousand dollars. So in the future, if you know renewable energy projects is something we want to look into, there is a pocket of funding there. And then just lastly, I put kind of that alternative transportation option tax credit with a fifty percent back would be something we would look at too. 
All right. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Cara, feel free to take it away. <laughs> take it away. All right. I know it's late. I'll make this really quick. Um, Logan and I reached out to the CSU Extension Office, which I don't know if you guys are familiar, um, but some background. They offer non-credit education uh, regarding agriculture and horticulture uh, throughout Colorado. Uh, it's a division of the university. Uh, it's funded largely through state and federal grant programs, and any county within Colorado can participate. Um, and so we met with um, originally, uh, I don't I'm not even sure how I got connected with this guy, but John Margle, he's actually from Douglas County, um, but he has an ongoing research project at Depot Park um, to study the uh, installation and maintenance methods um, at various parks across the Front Range. Depot Park is on that list. And so what it does um, is basically evaluates um, ex exactly that, the installation and maintenance of the um, the plants and the sustainability of the park itself and um, its ability to withstand uh, weeds, noxious weeds, um, and you know for the the plants to come back every year is supposed to be perennial. So um, it's being conducted over a five year period. Um, it's now in its second growing season, um, and it's really you know whether to to learn. You know whether or not this type of native low irrigation uh, perennial garden um, can resist the weed invasion and so we discussed opportunities around that uh, for community involvement and you know maybe getting some smaller volunteer groups together um, you know there's the option of you know keep it really small we could do you know bigger production which i don't think is really you know what we're looking to do, but it's an option. Um, and then just ongoing educational uh, sessions with the subcommittee. Um, next, I was directed from John to these two women, Lisa and Don, who are with Arapaho County. Um, and they are horticulture specialists, um, also a CSU extension office. And uh, Lisa provided just an abundance of information, um, educational links. Um, I don't know if anybody had a chance to look at the little write up um, Mel sent around this morning, but there's a lot of information in there um, regarding projects um, just around the county, educational opportunities. The website themso itself has just a ton of resources. Um, we do have the ability to to use any of the resources from the CSU website. Um, we just need to kind of notify them in advance. Um, but she said we're more than welcome to use any of that for our own website. You know, we can link to the CSU website. Um, there are all sorts of sustainable gardening, landscaping, native pollinators, um, things to do, things not to do. Um, you know, how to grow vegetables, how to fight um, pests, weeds, like all, anything, you name it, it has to do with gardening, it's on there. So they've got all sorts of resources. Um, and then she also mentioned, so Denver Metro has what's called a City Nature Challenge, which is a BioBlitz program. Um, and I know Dana was interested in doing like a BioBlitz program. And so this is more of a Denver metro area bio blitz and it's kind of like a city versus city who can come up with the most you know, biodiversity um, sort of tracking elements and it's conducted in the spring every year. So we've kind of missed the window for 2023, but it is something that we could look at for 2024. It's basically free participation. It's just getting the word out, getting the community to participate. And um, it's a community science based biodiversity study. Um, so you get, there's like a link or an app on your phone, you kind of track the insects, track, you know, the plants, um, and you're participating in this broader science study, you know, for the entire Denver metro area, um, which is pretty cool. Um, another one that Don runs is it's called the Native Bee Study, is that what it's called? 
Native Bee Watch, um, which again is very similar. It's a community science biodiversity project. Um, you sign up on the website. There's like a training you have to go through and the community members, you're logging, you know, your observations in your own garden and your own local parks. Um, and you're providing that science back to the university um, and to you know, the uh, to the community for you know science, ongoing science. So pretty cool um, free projects we can participate in. And so um, thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then she also connected me with another Don who is the energy program manager for Arapaho County. Um, and she's got numerous projects um, in the works more related to um, energy and water efficiency. Um, they, you know, they've installed, what is it, flow sensors and irrigation black flows, um, reprogrammed their irrigation controllers, They've mapped their properties, showing the areas where each valve serves. Um, they've hired tree surveys, um, and they've done retrofits to install rocks, gravel, where the snow melt consistently kills the grass every winter. Um, so there's things, you know, that she's been working on that we can maybe pull in, you know, to our own local community as things to take a closer look at, um, and maybe, you know, take a note from page and if we can incorporate some of those things then that's up great so um you know i think you know low hanging fruit like i said the native bee watch city nature challenge three things it's just get the word out get the community involvement um and then also using use of csu extension materials for you know the sustainability website um, education materials they've got tons of videos you know webinars i mean you can go on and apply to be a master gardener. So if you haven't heard of the master gardener program, um, it's a series of training that you can go through. It's like a two day weekend training, something like that. Um, and you come out knowing a whole lot more about gardening. So pretty cool stuff um, that they have out there. Uh, some ideas for programming, you know, volunteer uh, gardening group to help with weed maintenance at Depot Park. Um, you know, if there are other parks that need some love you guys just did in front of the rec center that's awesome um you know ongoing educational courses um and then another one that i thought of is maybe dedicate you know a section of a local park for you know vegetable growth intended for those in need around the community i don't know if you guys are familiar but the northeast corner of perfect gulch they do a little vegetable garden um for community uh, use. So something like that would be really cool as well. Um, and then the long term projects, which I know I've mentioned a couple times, but converting the annual garden beds over to something more sustainable and water friendly, cost efficient, getting rid of the annual annuals basically. So um, and then grant programs for like the turf replacement, um, smart meters, solar, you know, whatever else is out there. So. But lots of links in the sheet that Mel sent around today. So. I signed up for the Bee Watch one already. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> well, th thank you. That, that's extensive. Of, of all of that, you might have to think about this. What would you recommend or hope that we could sink our teeth into or do something? I mean, you've got a list this long. Right. And if there was one thing that you would like to see us well, I think it immediately would be, you know, that the low hanging fruit, which is the native bee watch. Uh, I would like to see us participate in the city nature challenge for 2024. So a little early to, you know, start talking about that, but in the fall, you know, start uh -huh. putting the word out um, and maybe, you know, get an, an article in the quarterly magazine for the fall, or if it's not too late for that. Um, you know, I can definitely chat. Yeah, I know that the cutoffs are like really far in advance, but um, you know, if it's possible to get an article um, 
you know, the magazine linking to, to some of these programs offered through CSU um, and just really, you know, partnering with them and using the materials that they've already got out there. Uh, we don't have to recreate anything from scratch. Like they have everything um, is already out there and they were very uh, generous to say, you know, feel free to, to, to link to us, to use our materials, you know, we ask just, just let us know, you know, that, that you're doing this. Uh, but no issues there and other cities, you know, use their materials as well. And so there's just a ton out there already. Um, but definitely, you know, with Englewood's social media page, like if we could put a link out, like sign up for the Native Bee Watch, um, that's an easy one, right? See how many people we can get to uh, participate in that. Um, and I think, you know, if we can use some of the stuff on the website, um, that's also a really easy tackling job as well. So. I had a quick question about your, um, the thing that you said essentially is the bio list that Dana is asking for. Mm -hmm. You said that's free and is it just like an app that you go through or is that? Yeah, so there's a link um, on the site. So it's called the City Nature Challenge and it's through Denver and it's for the, the entire Denver metro area. And um, there's a link to sign up and you're basically, you're competing with other cities and I, I don't know if, it's, I think there's an app and you go in and um, it's just kind of like the Native Bee Watch. You're logging all of the things that you're seeing, you know, in the garden, the plants, the insects, the, um, you know, birds, animals, wildlife, whatever, you're, you're making a note of it, right? And so you're making these scientific um, observations and then at the end, they kind of tally it up and they see, you know, which city had the most observations and they kind of do like a little competition between all the cities. Um, that sounds cool. Yeah. Sounds exactly like the bio blitz. Yeah, because then the bio blitz is exactly that. It's like getting a group together and you're making observations, you know, about exactly that. Insects, wildlife, plants, um, just things you're seeing um, in the dirt, in the, in the garden. Um, and just talking about, you know, what, what they are, what they mean, um, and just kind of educating around that. And so that's exactly what this is, but it brings in a more like a community involvement and that kind of friendly competition among our neighbors, um, neighboring cities. So I had never heard of it before. I was like, this is perfect. This is great. So, so a big part of this is communication, promotion, and education. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Should we put like some QR codes up around parks and people like mm -hmm. get this app? Yeah, <laughs> stuff like that. Like, uh, I, I love that idea. I think that the uh, social media piece of this is kind of a slam dunk. Uh, we're already seeing a, a Facebook post almost daily about something sustainability mm -hmm. the challenge of you know what what's your most sustainable thing and the pictures take and things like that but uh the the links you're talking that we saw the extensive links those could go right into social media yeah what do you think mel how could how could we uh promote or educate with some of these low-hanging fruits i can definitely reach with the communications team and show them um the document too. I think something that is really beneficial is if it kind of matches with like a national day. So if it's like National Bee Day, be like here's apps that you can use. Something that um, there's whole laws around like not promoting private businesses too. So if it's like a government or education website like university, those are usually easier. I think there's a little bit of red tape if it's like a private business doing stuff. So I can look at into that with them too and see what we can do. Yeah, I mean, I know they partner with cities all around and they certainly have, the, you know, the involvement at the county level. Um, and so they, the CSU extension has their own, you know, each county that participates has its own website. Um, so, so someone like me who's a gardener, if I see a funny looking bug in the garden, I can take my phone, take a picture, the data's collected because and by the way, last year, I saw some monster bug in the backyard. I called up Penn State. 
I, did, I mean, I've never seen it. But it was this big. But that's what yeah. would have been cool. If yeah. we could just take a picture of it and send it to CSU or something. Yeah, definitely. That one's very, well, I'd like to do that. That's and they really have cool. a whole, like, Q&A. You can email, you know, the master gardeners, and they've got somebody on call, you know, yeah. pretty much seven days a week to answer questions that you can, you know, email in um, if you're not sure about how to, you know, do something. Well, Englewood has the Denver Urban Garden right next to the Pollinator Garden, so all of those people would probably be very interested in playing with their cell phones and taking pictures of bugs. <laughs> I'd be interesting. I'd like to know yeah. what. Well, that's great. And I think it's it's great, you know, for the children in the community yeah. as well. Like yeah. if if there's these types of programs that we can get them involved. Um, on an educational level as well. I think that's great. So can you think about these be bug watchers? <laughs> exactly. They bug watchers. Oh, they love that kind of yeah, stuff. <laughs> Save the picture too. Yeah. Jolly. Cool. Do you know we, uh, I know we're imposed live, but could you kind of think this through or yeah. give us some ideas on how we promote it or spread the word or something? I, I think it's some pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Totally and I'm happy educational to mission. You know, if you want to connect me with the communications department, I'm happy to work with them, you know, more closely. Uh, if that's helpful, whatever, you know. I'm kind of not joking about the QR codes in the, the parks, because, like, you know, when I go to the dog park, like, almost every day um, at the Northwest Greenbelt, like, you know, I kind of see the same people hanging out in the park every day, and they, like, if there is something for them to, like, look at, you're like, oh, I guess I could be looking at bugs or plants while I'm sitting here with my dog. Yeah, like, I think that would be. Interesting. I think cool. that's a great, yeah. and it's like so easy. Yeah, like, not you know, not very expensive to to do something like that. So yeah, thank you. That's yeah. that's a lot of work. Thanks for doing that. But I, yeah, I'd love to see us. A lot of information. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Do we want to go to past follow ups? Uh, I think that's our last thing. Yeah. Is just past follow ups. I think that's it and gone, isn't it? The bio bullets, or is that? I mean, it's a two dollar request was we're past the deadline or something, aren't we on that? Yeah, I think so with well, I'm not sure I can reach out to Dan and learn more, but we can kind of table that if yeah. you all want. Well, to. I'm with the CSU extension. Um, I, but there might be some some programming like that we can utilize that doesn't. Um, I can reach out to Dana too and send her the link to that like free app thing too, and that maybe she doesn't know about her. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a good alternative. Um, okay, so the last thing, any questions on the city, the Parks and Rec's response to the question around the annual plants? So essentially it's a slow transition, but there is transitions to annual plants in the boxes. To, to perennials. Oh, to perennials, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. My brain is mush after 5 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so this is what yeah, so there was a question of, you know, what is the city doing to transition to perennials, just, just more sustainable and economic uh, move. So it's been kind of a slow addition over time. Um, annuals do give a pop of color, so, you know, they're there for that. But um, there are plans, especially in the park spawn that they were talking about. There's a lot of plans for annual perennials in that one as well. It wouldn't be hard to transition either because the rec center had some hidden perennials when we got in there and dug around we we uh, exhumed <laughs> or saved some of those perennials and so next year we would not need nearly as many mm -hmm. annuals to put in there and we might be able to plant a few perennials next year and then you're pretty much full i mean there's no more room to plant so we may be on the road to doing that we're on a good path we're, we're not good going path. backwards that's for sure. good path <laughs> okay, there's no public comment July meetings. Everyone can always send me ideas via email too if you have any ideas. Someone had pitched a depot park visit for the next meeting. That could be an option. Continue the tree ordinance discussion. Still trying to see if we can get someone from Grid Alternatives to come and present. Um, and then um, also Tim also told me that there would be maybe some interest from the communications department. Actually, this is perfect to come and see um, yeah. where there could be partnerships with the Sustainability Commission for the work that they do. Great. Awesome. Great. You think we could?
do all four of those or is that too much? Oh gosh, unless you want a, a two and a half hour meeting. <laughs> We're almost hitting that tonight. <laughs> Those are all good topics. Depot Park's beautiful, by the way. If you haven't been over there lately, yeah, it's check it out. It's really, when we were planning at the rec center, I swung by there and here we are putting these little annuals in at the rec center. And Depot Park was just exploding with flowers. It's really, really impressive. This and it still is. So yeah. I'm the student that's <laughs> asked the norm. <laughs> all right, Mike, you just have to. She was right. <laughs> Those things, these things take off once they get rooted. It's beautiful. Yeah. All right, Mike, you just have to adjourn and then we're good. Okay. Everybody okay with adjourning? Yeah. Thank you, yes. everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. you. Yeah. Some of the trees I've planted may not have a chance. <laughs> They're surrounded by parking lots and driveways. <laughs> I didn't know that either about that. No, I didn't. That makes sense, though.